Reading dirty five, the cost of capital. Learning outcomes, the candidate should be able to calculate and interpret the weighted average cost of capital of a company. Describe how taxes affect the cost of capital from different capital sh- uh, sources. Describe the use of target capital structure in estimating uh, WAC and how target capital structure weighted uh, may be determined. Examine, uh, explain how um. Marginal cost of capital rose in determining the net present value of a project. Calculate and interpret the cost of debt capital using the yield to a maturity approach and the debt rating approach. Calculate and interpret the cost of non-callable, non-convertible uh, preferred stocks. Uh, calculate and interpret the cost of equity capital using the capital asset pricing model approach. Uh, divide a uh, dividend ca- uh, discount model approach. And a bond yield plus risk premium approach. Calculate and interpret the beta and cost of capital of projects. Describe uses of country risk premiums and estimating the cost of equity. Describe the marginal cost of capital schedule. Explain why it may be upward sloping and um, upward sloping and what respect an additional capital and calculate and interpret its breaking points. Explain and demonstrate current treatment of fl- flotation costs. Introduction: A company grows by making investments. By making investments that are expected to increase revenue and profits, the company acquires uh, the capital or funds necessary to make such investments. By borrowing or using funds from uh, owners. By applying this capital to investments with long-term benefits, the company is producing value today. But how much value? The answer depends not only on the investment's expected future cash flow, but also the uh, on the cost of the funds borrowing is not costless. Neither is the owner's funds. The cost of the capital is an important ingredient for in both investment decision making uh, of the company and its capital, and it's an important ingredient for both. Um, valuation of the company by investors. If a company invests in projects that produces a return access to the cost of capital, the company has created value. In contrast, if the company invests in projects whose return is less than the cost of capital, um, then the company actually destroys value. Therefore, the estimation of cost of capital is a central issue in corporate financial management for the analysts seeking to evaluate a company's investment programs. Uh, and its competitive position and accurate estimate of a company's cost of capital is important as well. Cost of capital estimations uh, is a ca- is a challenging task, as we have readily implied. The cost of capital is not ob- uh, observable, but rather must be estimated. Arriving at a cost of capital estimate requires a host of assumptions and estimates. Another challenge is that uh, the cost of capital is inappropriately applied to a specific investment depends on the characteristics of the investment. The riskier the investment's cash flow, the greater the cost of capital. In reality, a company must estimate project-specific cost of capital. What is often done, however, is that the estimate of the cost of capital for the company as the whole is adjusted overall corporate cost of the capital upwards or downwards to reflect the risk of a contemplated project relative to the company's average project. Uh, this reading is organized as follows. In the next sections, we introduce the cost of capital and its basic computation. Section 3 presents the selection of methods for estimating costs and various sources of capital. Section 4 discusses issues that analyst faces in using the cost of capital. A summary concludes the reading. Cost of capital. The cost of capital is the rate of return that suppliers of capital, um, bo- uh, bondholders, and owners require as compensation for the contribution of capital. Another way to look at the cost of capital is the opportunity cost of funds on the supplier of capital. A potential supplier of capital will not voluntarily invest in a company unless its returns meet its or exceeds what is the suppliers could earn elsewhere. In the investments of comparable risks, a company typically have. Uh, several alternatives for raising capital, including issuing equity or debt. The instruments that share uh, characteristics of debt and equity, uh, each source selected becomes a component of the company's funding and has a cost um, that may be called the component cost of capital. Because we are using the cost of capital in the evaluation uh, of investment opportunities, we are dealing with a marginal cost, which is what which it would co- cost to raise additional funds and the potential investment projects. Therefore, the cost of capital that ha- that the investment analyst is concerned with is the marginal cost. 
Let's focus on the cost of capital for the entire company, the cost of capital of the company's required rate of return, the investor's demand, and the average risk uh, investment of the company. The most, the most common way to estimate the required rate of return is to calculate the marginal cost of each of the various sources of capital and then calculate the weighted average of the cost. The weighted average is referred to as the weighted average cost of capital or the WAC. The WAC is referred to as the marginal cost of the capital, MCC, because it is the cost uh, that a company incurs for additional capital. Capital, the weights, um, the weights uh, in this weighted average are the proportions of the various sources of capital that the company uses to support its investment programs. Therefore, WAC is the most uh, general term as such. Uh, there are important points concerning the calculation of WAC as shown in equation. Uh, uh, Equation 1 that the analyst must be familiar with. The next two sections addresses two key issues, taxes and selection of weights. Taxes and cost of capital. Notice uh, that in equation 1 is addressed expected tax cost on new debt financing by factor of 1 minus T in the United States and many other tax jurisdictions. The interest on debt financing is a dedication or is a deduction to arrive at taxable income. Taking the tax deductibility of, ta of interest as the base case, the, we address the pre tax cost of debt for this tax shield, multiplying RD by 1 minus T, uh, results in an estimate of the after tax cost of debt. For example, suppose a company pays 1 million on interest and on its 10 million of debt, the cost of its debt is not 1 million, but it's the interest expense reduced taxable income by 1 million, resulting in a lower tax if a company is subject to a tax rate of 40%. Thus, one million of interest costs of the company one million multiplied by one minus zero point four, is as such. Estimating the cost of common equity capital is more challenging than estimating the cost of debt uh, capital. Debt capital involves a stated legal obligation on the part of the company to pay interest and repay the principals on the borrowing. Equity entails no such obligations. Estimating the cost of conversional, a uh, preferred equity is rather straightforward because uh, the divided. Is generally stated and fixed, but estimating the cost of, of common equity is challenging. There are several methods available for estimating the cost of common equity, and we discussed two in this reading. The first method uses the capital asset pricing model. The second method uses the dividend discount model, which is based on discounted cash flows. No matter the method, there is uh, no need to make any adjustments on the ca in the in the cost of equity for taxes because the uh, payments to owners, whether in the form of dividends or returns on capital are not tax deductible for the company. Weighted and um, weights of the weighted average. How to determine? How do we determine the weight to use? Ideally, we want to use the proportions of each source of capital for the company would use the projects or the company. If we assume that a company has a target capital structure and raises capital consistent with this target, we should use the target capital structure. The target capital structure is the capital structure that a company is striving to obtain. If we know the capital, uh, if we know the company's target capital structure, then of course we should. Use this on our analysis. Someone inside the company, however, uh, someone outside of the company, however, such as an analyst, typically does not know the target cap uh, capital structure and must estimate it using one of several approaches. Assuming a company's current capital structure, uh, estimating trends of the company capital structure uses averages of the comparable company's capital structures. In the absence of knowledge of a company's target capital structure, we may take method one as the baseline. Note that applying method three. Uh, we use an unweighted arithmetic average as it is often uh, done in simplicity. An alternative is to calculate a weighted average, which would give more weight to, to larger companies. Um, yeah. Applying the cost of capital to uh, capital budgeting and security value valuation. Uh, when some insight uh, now into the calculations of the cost of capital lets us continue to improve our understanding of the roles it plays in financial analysis. A, ch a chef uh, used a marginal a chief used the marginal cost of capital estimate and capital budgeting decision making. What role does marginal cost of capital play in the company's investment program, and how do we adopt it when we need to when we need to evaluate a specific investment project? A company's marginal cost of capital (MCC) may increase as additional capital is raised, or as returns to a company's investment opportunities are generally believed to decrease as the company makes additional investments, as represented by the investment opportunities schedule, the IOS. Not the not not the, not the IOS of Apple, operating system. 
Um, we show this a uh, relation in Figure One, graphing the upward sloping marginal cost and the capital schedule against the downward sloping investment opportunity schedule in the context of a company's investment decisions. The optimal capital budgeting is the amount of capital raised and invested. At which the marginal cost of capital equals the marginal return of from investment. In other words, the optimal capital budgeting occurs when the marginal cost of capital intersects from the investment opportunity schedule as seen in figure one. The relationship between MECC and IOS provides a broad picture for the basic decision making problems of a company. However, we are often interested in valuation of individual projects or even a proportion of the company, such as a divided or division or the product or line. In these applications, we are interested in the cost of capital for the project product um, or divisions as opposed to the cost of capital for the company overall. The cost of capital um, in these applications should reflect the riskiness of the future cash flows of the projects. Products or divisions for an average risk project, the opportunity cost of capital is the company's whack. Um, if the uh, if the systematic risk of the project is above or below the average relative to the company's current portfolio of projects, and upwards or downwards adjustments respectively is made to the company's whack, companies may take a, a ad hoc or a symmetric approach uh, to making some adjustments. The decisions of the symmetric approach is somewhat advanced topic to defer in section four point one. The WAC and MAC corresponds, uh, corresponding to the average risk of the company adjusted appropriately for the risk of the given project plays a role in capital budgeting decisions, making based on the net present value, the MPV of the projects. Recall from the reading on the capital budgeting that the MPV, uh, that the MPV is the present value of all project cash flows. It is useful to think, uh, is to think of this as the difference between the present value of the cash inflows discounted as the opportunity cost of the capital app applicable to the specific project and the net present value of the cash outflows discounted using the same opportunity cost of capital. Uh, if the investment MPV is positive, the company should undertake the project. If we choose to use the capitals, uh, the company's whack to in the calculation of MPV of the project, we are assuming that the project has a and the same risk as the average risk project of the company and will have a cons constant target capital structure throughout the useful life. Um, these may not be realistic or appropriate assumptions for the potential drawbacks using a company's whack and valuation projects. However, alternative approaches are subject to drawbacks as well. And the, uh, and the approaches outlined are wide, uh, wide acceptance. For analysts, the second key, use the marginal cost of capital in the security valuation um, and the use of one of uh, several discounted cash flow valuation models available I mean, for, for a particular valuation model. If these cash flows are cash flows to the company's supplier of capital, the analysts use the weighted average cost of capital of the company in its valuation. If the cash flows are strictly those belonging to the company's owners, such as free cash flows uh, to equity or div dividends, the analyst using, uses the cost of equity capital to find the present value of these flows. Uh, in the next section, we discuss you know, how the analyst may approach the calculations of the components, cost, cost of capital, focusing on debt preferred stocks and common equity. Cost of different sources of capital. Each source of capital has a different cost because of the differences among the sources, such as uh, seniority, contractual uh, co commitments, and potential value of the tax shields. We focus on the cost cost of three primary sources of capital: debt, preferred equity, and common equity. Uh, cost of capital, cost of debt. Uh, the cost of debt is the cost of debt financing to a company when it issues a bond or takes out a bank loan. We discussed two methods to in, um to estimate the before tax cost of debt, and the yield of maturity approaches to um. Uh, debt rating approach, yield to maturity approach. The yield to maturity approach is the annual return that the investor earns uh, on a bond. Uh, if the investor purchases a bond today and holds on to a maturity, in other words, the, the yield RD, this uh, equates to the present value of the bond's promise payments to the market price. The valuation equation assumes the bond pays a semi-annual interest and that any intermediate cash flows are reinvested at the rate of RD divided by 2. Example 4 uh, illustrates the calculations of after-tax cost of debt. Uh, when a reliable uh, current market price uh, for a company's debts is not available, the debt rating approach can be used to estimate the before-tax cost of debt based on a company's debt rating. 
Uh, we estimate to be for a tax cost of debt by using the yield on a comparable, comparable, uh, comparably uh, rated bond for maturities uh, that closely matches the company existing existing debt. Suppose a company's capital structure includes debt with average maturity or duration of 10 years, and a company's marginal tax rate is 35%. If the company's rating is AAA or AAA, then the yield of the debt uh, with the same debt rating as a similar maturity is 4%. Uh, considerations when using this approach is that debt rating and rating of debt itself, uh, with the issuer being only one of the considerations. Other factors such as uh, debt seniority and, 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 and security also affects rating and yield. Uh, so care must be taken to uh, to consider the likely types of debt to be issued by the company to in determining the comparable uh, debt rating and yield to the debt rating approach is a simple example of pricing on the basis of valuation relevant characteristics with the bond make markets um has been known as equiv uh, as as e evaluated prices or matrix pricing. Issues in estimating the cost of debt. Uh, up to now, we have uh, assumed that the interest on debt is a fixed amount each period. We could observe market yields of the company's existing debt or market yields of debt of similar risk uh, estimating for before tax co uh, co cost of debt. However, the company must be uh, issues free floating debt, uh, which interest rate adjusted periodically according to the prescribed index, such as the prime rate of LIBOR. Over the life of the instrument, estimating the cost of, of floating rate securities is difficult because the cost of this uh, form of capital over the long term depends not only on the current yield but also on the future yield. And analysts may use the current term structure of interest rate and term structure uh, dairy to assign an average cost to, uh, to such instruments. Debt with uh, option like features, non-rated debt leases, cost of preferred stock. The cost of uh, preferred stock is the cost of the cap uh, of the company has committed to pay preferred stockholders as the preferred dividend when it issues preferred stocks. In the case of non-convertible, non-callable non preferred stocks that has a fixed dividend rate and no maturity date, we can use the formula for valuation of a preferred stock as such. Therefore, the cost of preferred stock is the is the preferred stock's dividend per share divided by the current preferred stock price per share. Unlike interest on debt, the dividends uh, our preferred stocks are not tax deductible by the company. Therefore, there is no adjustments. Um, there is no adjustments to the cost of the taxes. A preferred stock has a number of features that affect the yields. That hence the cost of the preferred stock. These features include a call option, cumulative dividends, um, participating dividends, adjustable rate dividends, and convertibility into common stock. When estimating a yield based on current yield of the company's preferred stock, we must make appropriate adjustments to um, of the capital or of effects of these features on the yield of an issue. For example, if the company has a callable, convertible preferred stock, outstanding, uh, yet it's expected that the company will, will issue non-callable Non-convertible preferred stocks in the future, we would have to use either the current yield or the comparable company's non-callable non-convertible preferred stocks to estimate the yield on preferred equity using methods outstanding the scope of this rating. The cost of common equity. Uh, the cost of common equity, uses, usually referred to simply as the cost of equity, is the rate of return required by a company's common shareholders. A uh, comp uh, company may increase the common equity through uh, the reinvestment of earnings, that is, retained earnings, or through the issuance of new shares of stock. Uh, as we discussed earlier, the estimation of cost of equity is uh, changing because uh, of the uncertain nature of the future. Um, as we just, yeah. Capital asset pricing approach, um, the capital asset pricing approach, the CAPM approach, as used in the basis of the relationship from the capital asset pricing model theory, that it expected returns on a stock is the sum of the risk-free rate of return uh, and a premium for bearing stocks market risk. 
a risk-free asset is defined here as an asset that has no default risk. A common proxy for a risk-free rate uh, is the yield on a default-free government uh, debt instrument. In general, uh, the selection of the of the appropriate risk-free rate should be guided by a duration of uh, projection cash flows. If we are evaluating a project with an estimated useful life of 10 years, we may want to use the rates uh, on a 10-year treasury bond. The expected market risk premium is the premium that investors demand for investing in a market portfolio relative to the risk-free rate. When using the, the CAPM to estimate the cost of equity, in practicing we typically estimate beta relative to an equity market index. In that case, the market premium estimate uh, we are using uh, is actually an estimate of the equity risk premium. An alternative to the CAPM is a, is a, is a common date risk that may not be captured by the market portfolio alone in the in the the multifactorial model that incorporates factors that may be other sources of price risks, uh, including macroeconomic factors and company-specific factors in general. Um, where the basic idea of the of the mo- of the manufacturer model is the CAPM uh, beta may not capture all the risk, especially in a global context, which includes inflation, business cycles, interest rates, exchange rates, and default risks. There are several ways to estimate the equity risk premium. There, uh, though there is no general agreement as to the best approach, uh, the three we discussed are the historical risk uh, premiums approach and the divided discount model approach and the survey approach. The historical equity risk premium approach is a well-established approach based on the assumption that the realized equity risk premium observed over a long period of time is a good indicator of the expected equity risk premium. This approach requires uh, compiling historical data to find the average rate of return uh, of a country's uh, marginal of a company's market portfolio and the average rate of return uh, for the risk-free rate uh, in that country. For example, an analyst might use the historical return to the topics index to estimate the risk premium for Japanese equities, the expectational bull market observations during during the second half of the 1990s and the bustering of the technology bubble following during the years of 2000 and 2002 reminds us that the time periods of such estimates should be covered uh, complete market cycles, uh, diamonds, dimsum, uh, Paul Marsh and Mike Staunton conducted an analysis of the equity risk premiums uh, observed in market located in 17, uh, 16 countries, including the U.S., over the period of 1900 to 2002. These researchers found they annualized U.S. equity risk premiums relative to U.S. Treasury bonds with 5.2, uh, 5.3% geometric mean and 7.2% arithmetic means. They also found they analyzed U.S. equity risk premiums relative to bonds with 4.4% geometric means and 6.4% arithmetic means. Note that the arithmetic means is greater than geometric mean as a result of significant volatility. Of the observed market, uh, as a market rate of return and of the observed risk-free rate, under the assumptions of uh, unchanging distribution of returns through time, the arithmetic mean is the unbiased estimate of the expected single uh, period equity risk premium. But the geometric mean better reflects growth over um, rates over multiple periods. In Table One, we provide historical estimates of the equity risk premium of sixteen developed markets uh, for Di- Di- Nimsa, Marsh, and Staunton's uh, study. To illustrate the historical uh, method is to, uh, is as applied in CAPM surprise. Uh, suppose that we use the historical geometric mean of U.S. equity of 4.8% and the value of Citibank Incorporated as early, as in early t- January 2006, according to Standard & Poor's. <coughs> Citibank has a beta of 1.32 at a time using 10-year Treasury uh, U.S. Treasury bonds as a yield of 4.38% represents the risk-free rate uh, to estimate the cost of cap of equity for Citibank is 4. Uh, 38 percent plus 1.38 uh, multiplied by 4.38 which is 10.72 percent the historical premium approach uh, has several limitations one limitation is that the level of risk of a stock index may change over time another is that the risk aversion of investors may change over time 
And still another limitation is that the estimates of are sensitive to the method of estimation. And the historical period covered. The second approach for estimating the equity risk premium is the dividend discount model based approach or implied risk premium approach, which is implemented using the Gordon Growth Model. For developed markets, uh, corporate earnings often meet at, at last, at least approximately, the model's assumption of the long run trend growth rate. We extract the premium by analyzing how the market prices. Our index, that is when uh, we use the relationship between the value of an index and expected dividends, assuming a constant growth in dividends. We use P0 or P0 in the current market's value of the equity market index and D1 as the dividends expected next period uh, in the index RE is required to rate of return on the market and G is the expected growth rate of dividends. We solve the, for the required rate of return on the market as such, therefore the expectation Return on the market is the sum of the dividend yield and the growth rate in dividends. Um, the equity risk premium thus is the difference between the expected return on the equity market and the risk-free rate. Suppose the expected dividend uh, yield on an equity index is 5% and the expected growth rate of uh, dividends on the index is 2%. The expected return on the market according to the Gordon growth model is as such. Okay. Another approach to uh, estimates to risk uh, the equity risk premium is quite direct. Ask a panel of finance experts uh, for the estimates and uh, take the mean of the response to the survey approach, for example, out of the U.S. survey. So, yes, yeah, so that's quite, it's quite f- straightforward. Um, the bond yield plus pr- premium approach. The bond yield plus premium approach is based on the fundamental tenet that uh, in, fin- in financial theory that the cost of capital is riskier cash flows and higher than the less riskier cash flows. In this approach, we sum the before tax cost of debt, the RD, and the risk premium of the captured, the additional yield of the company's stock relative to its bonds. An estimate is, therefore, RE equals RD plus risk premium. The risk premium compensates for the additional risk of the equity compared with the debt. Ideally, the risk premium uh, is forward-looking, presenting additional risk associated with the stock of the, stock of the company as compared with the bond. On the same company, however, we often estimate this uh, premium using historical spreads between bond yields and stock prices in developed country uh, markets. A typical risk premium adds uh, added is the range of three to ten, uh, to five percent. Again, looking uh, looking again at Citigroup as of early January in two thousand six, the yield of maturity of the co- Citigroup um, bond maturity in two thousand sixteen was approximately as such. Types of uh, topics and cost of capital estimation to calculation of co- we, when calculating a company's weighted average cost of capital, the WAC, it is essential to understand the risk factors that have been considered in determining the risk free rate. The equity risk premium and the beta to ensure uh, consistent calculations of WAC to avoid the double uh, counting and omissions of, po- uh, of po- po- potent risk factors, estimating beta and determining a project beta when the analyst uses a, a CAPM. To estimate the cost of equity, he or she must estimate beta. The estimation of beta presents many choices um, as well as challenges. Are one, one common method of estimating a company's stock beta is to use the market model regression of the company's stock returns against market returns over T periods. Um, when when uh, A hat is the, is, is the estimate inter- intercept and B hat is the estimated slope of the regression that is used to estimate of beta. However, beta estimates are sensitive to models, uh, methods of estimation of due to usage, considered uh, some of the issues, the estimation period, the periodic uh, periodic city, periodicity of the return interval, the selection of an approach on market index, the use of uh, smoothing techniques, adjustments of small uh, capitalization stock arriving at, at the estimated beta for the publicly traded company is generally not a problem because of the accessibility of stock return data. The ease of use of estimating beta using uh, simple regression and of availability of estimated betas on publicly traded companies from financial analyst vendors such as uh, Barra, Bloomberg, Thompson Financials, uh, Datastream, Reuters, involved a value line. The challenge is, is to estimate the beta company for a not publicly traded or estimates of beta for a pub, uh, for a project that is not on the average or typical 
project of publicly traded companies estimating a beta in these cases requires a proxying for beta by using information on a project or companies combined with the beta of a publicly traded company. The beta of a company or project is affected by the systematic components of business risk and by financial risk. Both by these factors affect the uncertainty of the cash flows of the companies or project. The business risk of a company or a project is the risk related to the uncertainty of revenue, referred to as the sales risk or the operating risk, which is the risk attributed to the company's operating cost structures. Sales risk is affected by the uh, elasticity of the demand of the product and cyclicality uh, of the revenues and the structures of the competition in the industry. Operating risk is affected by the relative mix of fixed and variable operating costs. The greater the fixed operating cost relative to the variable operating cost, the greater the uncertainty of income and cash flows from operations. The financial risk is the uncertainty of net income and net cash flows attributed to the use of financing. Uh, that has a fixed cost such as debt and leases, the greater the use of fixed uh, financing sources of capital relative to variable sources, the greater the financial risks. In other words, a company that relies heavily on debt financing instead of equity financing is assumed a greater deal of financial risks. How does a financial analyst estimate a beta for a company or project that is not publicly traded? One company method is the pure play method which requires using a comparable publicly traded company beta and adjust it for the financial leverage differences. A comparable company is a company that has a similar business risks. The reason is referred to as the pure play method is one of the easiest ways to identify a comparable projects is to find a company on the same industry that is on the same line of base of business. For example, if the analyst is examining a project involves drug stores, appropriate comparables of the U.S. may be a Walgreens, a CVS corporations, and Rite Aid corporations. In estimating a beta in this way, the analyst must make adjustments to account for differences, the different differing degrees of financial leverage. This requires a process of un unlevering or uh, and levering the beta. The beta of the comparable is in first un. Levered by removing the effects of its financial leverage, the unlevered beta is often referred to as the asset beta because it reflects the business risk of the asset. Once we determine the unlevered beta, we adjust for the capital structure of the company or project that is a focus of our anal analysis. In other words, we lever the asset beta to arrive at an estimate of the equity beta for the project of or company of interest. For a given company, we can unlever its equity beta to estimate its asset beta. To do this, we must determine the relationship between a company's asset beta and its equity beta. Because the company's risk is shared between the creditors and owners, we can represent the company's uh, risk as such and get such a conclusion. But interest on debt uh, deducted by the company are to arrive at taxable income, so the claim that creditors have on the company's asset is does not cost the company uh, the full amounts, but rather the after-tax claim, the burden of tax financing is actually less due to the interest on deductibility. We can represent the asset beta of a company as the weighted average of the betas of debt and equity after considering the effects of tax deductibility of interest. Uh, we generally assume that the company's uh, debt does not have market risk. Uh, this means that the returns on debt do not vary with the returns on the market which we generally assume to be true for most large companies. Therefore, the market risk of a company's equity is not affected by both the assets market risk uh, and a factor representing the non-diversifiable non non proportions of the company's financial risk. Suppose a company has an equity base of 1.5, an equity uh, to, a debt to equity ratio of 0 0.4, and a marginal tax rate of 30% using equation 4, the company's asset beta is as, as such. Therefore, uh, the underlay the underlying calculations produces a measure of market risk for the assets of a company, ignoring the company's capital structure. We use the levering calculations in equation ten to estimate the, the market risk of a company given a specific asset risk, a marginal tax rate, and capital structure. We can use the same un unlevering and levering calculations to estimate the asset risk and equity risk for a project. We start with the equity beta uh, of a comparable company which is the levered beta, and then convert it into the equi equivalent asset beta for the unlevered company. 
once we have the estimates uh, of the unlevered beta, we, which is the company's asset risk, we young can use the project's capital structure and marginal tax rate to convert these asset beta into the equity beta for the project B. Yeah. Okay. The country risk. The use of a stock's beta to capture the country risk of a project is well supported in the, in, in the empirical studies that examines developing uh, developed countries. However, beta does not appear to adequately capture risk um, country risk for companies in developing countries. A common approach for dealing with this problem is to adjust the cost of equity estimated using the CAPM. The CIPM by adding a country spread to a market risk premium. The country spread is also referred to as the country risk premium. Perhaps the simplest esti uh, estimate of country spread is the sovereign yield spread, which is the difference between the government bond yield in a country the denominated in the currency of the developed country and a treasury bond yield on a similar maturity bond in a developed country. However, the approach may be too uh, coarse for the purpose of risk premium estimations. Another approach is, the calculate, is to calculate the country risk premium as the product of the sovereign yield spread on the, um, and the ratio of the volatility of the developing country equity market and the sovereign bond a market determined the currency of the developing country. The logic of this calculation is the sovereign yield spread captures uh, the general risk of the country, which is then addresses the volatility of the stock market relative to the bond market. The country risk premium is then used uh, in addition to the equity premium estimated for the for the project uh, in a developed country. Therefore, the equity risk premium uh, for a project is developed in country is four point. 4.5% uh, and a country risk premium is 3% and total equity risk premium of using a CAPM estimation is 7.5%. You'll see just add it on, it's just quite straightforward. Okay, marginal cost and capital structure uh, schedule. As we noted in section 2.3, uh, as a company raises uh, more funds, the cost of the different sources of capital may change, resulting in a change in the weighted average cost of capital for different levels of financing. The result is the marginal cost of capital MCC schedule, which we often depict in graphical form as weighted average cost of capital for different amounts of capital raised. As we shown earlier in figure one, why would the cost of capital change as more capital is raised? One source of a difference in the, in the cost depending on the amount of capital raised is the company may have existing debt um, which uh, with a bond covenant that restrictions that restricts the company from issuing debt with similar seniority as existing debt or debt insurance tests uh, may restrict a company's ability to incur additional debt at the same seniority based on one or more financial tests or co uh, conditions. For example, if we, if a company issues a senior debt uh, such that the uh, any additional debt at the seniority violates the debt incurrence test of an existing bond covenant, the company may have an issue uh, less senior debt or even equity, which would have a higher cost. Another source of increasing marginal cost of capital is a devi deviation from the target capital structure uh, in the ideal theoretical world, a company has a target capital structure and goes to the market each a period, raises the capital in, the, in these proportions. However, as the practical matters, companies do not necessarily tap the markets in these ideal proportions because of considerations of economies of skill and raising new capitals and market conditions. Because of such uh, perceived economies of skills, companies tend to issue new securities such, uh, that in, such at any given period it may deviate from the proportions detected by any target or optimal capital structure. In other words, these short-run deviations are due to the lumpiness of security uh, issues, uh, issuance. As the company experiences devi deviations from the target capital structures, the marginal cost of capital may increase, reflecting these deviations. Yeah. 
Uh, if the company raises capital according to the target capital structure, the proportions of 40% debt and 60% equity, the company faces a marginal cost capital schedule uh, that is upward sloping, which breaks points of 5 million, 10 million, and 12.5 million, uh, 13.3 million as the pre- uh, expected figure two. These break uh, points are determined from the amount of capital um, at which the cost changes calculated as such. Uh, for example, the first bank point uh, for debt financing is reached with two million divided by zero point four, which is five million. Uh, it equals five million of new capital raised. The first break uh, point attributed to the change in equity cost occurs in six million divided by zero point six, which is ten million. Example three thirteen illustrates a marginal cost of capital sh- schedules, um, which. Or with breakpoints, and also how the WAC figures uh, in choice of an optimal capital structure. Flotation costs. Um, when a company raises a new capital, it generally seeks assistance of, of investment bankers. Investment bankers charge the companies a fee based on the size and type of the offering. Uh, the uh, this fees is referred to as the flotation cost in the case of debt and preferred stock. We do not usually incorporate flotation costs in estimated cost of capital because the amount of these costs are quite small, uh, often less than 1%. However, with equity issuance, the flotation cost may be substantial. Um, so we should consider the, these when estimating the cost of external quality equity capital. For example, uh, Lynn Mu Lee, uh, Scotland Lockhead, and Jay Ritter, and, and Quan Shao Zhao observes average flotation cost for a new equity in the United States of 7.11%. The flotation cost of a country is different. The U.S. Uh, experienced um, these countries. Yeah. Should we incorporate flotation costs to the cost of capital? There are two views on the topic. One view, which you have found in often textbooks, is that incorporate the flotation costs and the cost of capital. The other view is that the flotation cost should not be included in, in the cost of capital, but rather incorporated in any valuation analysis as an additional cost of the project. Consistent with the first view, uh, we can specify flotation costs in monetary terms uh, as the amount per share uh, or a percentage of a share price with flotation costs in monetary terms on the per share basis of F, the cost of equity is as such. The problem with this approach is that the flotation costs are the cash flows at the in- initiation of the projects and affected the value of any projects by reducing the initial cash flows. Adjusting the cost of capital for flotation costs is incorrect because by doing so, we are adjusting the present value of the future cash flows by fixed uh, percentage. In the, exa- in the above example, a difference of 22 basis points, which does not necessarily equate to the present value of the flotation cost. Uh, the alternative is our, our recommended approach is to make the adjustments to the cash flows in the valuation computation. For example, consider a project that requires a 60,000 initial cost outlay uh, and is expected to produce a cash flow of 10,000 each year for 10 years. Suppose the company um, marginal tax rate is 40% and that the before tax cost of debt is 5%. Furthermore, suppose that the company divided the next um, period in 1 euros. The current price of the stock is 20 uh, euros and the expected growth rate is uh, 10%. Assume that a company will finance the project for 40 years. Uh, t- such, uh, table 6 summarizes the information of the, of the capital. Um, so let's hear some calculations. So if it's preferred to deduct the flotation cost as part of the net present value calculations, what we do, um, why do we see the adjustments in cost of capital so often in textbooks? The first reason is that they're often difficult to identify particular financing associated with a project using the adjustment for flotation costs and the, the, and the cost of capital may be useful in specific project financing cannot be identified. Second, by adjusting the cost of capital for flotation costs, uh, it is easier to demonstrate how cost of financing and capital changes as the company exhausts internally generated equity and switches to externally generated equity. Why do CFOs do? In this reading, we have introduced uh, methods used by uh, to estimate the cost of capital for a company or a project. What do the companies actually um, u- actually use when making investment decisions? On a survey to a large number of U.S. company CFOs, uh, John Graham and um, Campbell Harvey 
asked about methods of companies actually used the survey relates to the following. The most popular method for estimating a cost of equity and capital assets pricing models. Few companies use the dividend cash flow model to estimate cost of, ca- uh, cost of equity. Publicly traded companies are more likely to use the uh, capital asset pricing model than the private companies. In evaluating projects, the majority uh, use a single company cost of capital, but a large proportion applies uh, some type of risk adjustment for individual projects. The survey also reveals the single factor capital asset pricing model in the most popular method for estimating the cost of equity. Do the next most popular method, respectfully, an average stock return and manufacturer return models. The lack of popularity of the dividend discount model indicates that the approach, uh, which was once favored, has lost its following uh, in practice. Um, in a survey of publicly traded multinational European countries, um, evidence consistent with the survey I found that 70% of companies uses the CAPM to determine the cost of equity. Uh, this compares with 73.5% of U.S. companies uh, use the CAPM in a survey of both publicly traded and private uh, U- European countries. Dirk Burnin, uh, Abbe Dejon, and uh, other researchers resulted that uh, companies are more likely to use more sophisticated methods such as the CAPM and estimating the cost of equity. Um, we learned from the survey evidence that the CAPM is more uh, is popular method for estimating the cost of equity capital, and that is used uh, that uh, use less by smaller private companies. The latter, um, the latter results is not surprising because the difficulty in estimating systematic risk, um, in cases in which the company's equity is not publicly traded. Summary in this reading, we provided. An overview of the techniques used in the calculation of cost of capital for companies and projects. We estimated the weighted uh, average of cost of capital, discussing the methods commonly used to estimate the components of cost of capitals and the weights applied to these components, the inter- the international the dimensions of the cost of capital, as well as key factors influencing the cost of capital. We also analyzed the weight um, cost of capital and the weighted average t- after tax marginal uh, cost of each source of capital. Uh, and and uh, an analyst uses the WAC of um, valuation. For example, the WAC is used to value the project using a net present value method which is MPV is equal to present value of inflows minus the present value of outflows. The four tax of debt is generally estimated by means of one of two methods, yield to maturity or bond rating. The yield to maturity method in estimating before tax cost of debt and the familiar bond evaluation equation, assuming a semi-annual coupon payment, the equity payment is as such. We solve for the six-month yield um and to analyze it to arrive at the before tax cost of debt. Be- um, because interest payments are generally tax deductible, the after tax cost is the true effective cost of debt in the, in the company. If a current yield or bond rating is not available, such as the case of a private company with outrating debt or a project, the estimate of a cost of debt becomes more challenging. The cost of preferred stock is the preferred stock uh, divided, a uh, dividend divided by the current preferred stock price. The cost of equity is the rate of return uh, required by a company's common stock uh, stockholder. We estimate the cost of using the CAPM or its variant or its divided uh, dividend discount method. The CAPM is the approach most commonly used to calculate the cost of. Uh, the cost of common stock, the three components needed to calculate the common stock, a risk-free rate to equity, risk premium, and beta. Um, the estimation of the cost of equity uh, using a CAPM. Um, when we do not have publicly traded equity, we may be able to use the pure pay uh, method in, in, in which we estimate the un, an unlevered beta for a company uh, with similar business risks. Uh, it is often the case that the country of foreign exchange risk are... Um, are diversified so that we can use the estimated beta in the CAPM analysis, often in the case in which the risks cannot be diversified away. We can adjust the measure of uh, systematic risk by a country equity premium to reflect the non-diversified risk. The, divide, the dividend discount model approach is an alternative approach to calculating the cost of equity, whereby the cost of equity is estimated as follows. We can estimate the growth rate uh, in a dividend discount model by using a published uh, forecast. 
of an analyst by estimating the suitable uh, the sustainable growth rate. And estimating the cost of equity and alternative to the CAPM and dividend discount of purchase is the bond yield plus the risk of premium approach. In this approach, we estimated the before tax costs of debt and the add uh, and add a risk of premium that reflects the additional risk associated with the company's equity, the marginal cost of capital schedule. Is a graph plotting the new fund raised by a company on the x-axis and the cost of capital on the y-axis. The cost of capital is lever, is level to the point at which one of the cost of capital changes, such as when the company bumps up against the debt covenants requiring to use the co- uh, another form of capital. We calculate a break point using information on. Uh, on when the different sources cost ca- changes and the proportions of a company uses when it raises debt capital. Uh, flotation costs are costs incurred in the process of raising additional capital. The preferred method of including these costs in an analyst is an initial cash flows in the valuation analysis. Survey evidence tells us that the CAPM method is the popular method uh, is is most popular method used by companies in estimating the cost of equity. The CAPM method is more popular for larger publicly traded companies, which is understandable considering the additional analysis and assumptions required to estimate the systematic risk for a private uh, company or project. Okay, so this is rating thirty five. Okay, so we will continue study session uh, 11, I believe, study session 11 in our next reading about corporate finance too. I do hope my readings have been helpful and I hope to see you guys next time. Okay, good.